I'm sure you're familiar with the thought experiment of the ship of Theseus. I mean, you're a bright person after all. Theseus, the mythical Grecian hero and king slash founder of the city-state of Athens. Quite the industrious figure, many an adventure did he undertake. You know, like defeating the six Chthonic guardians or capturing the Marathonian bull. But probably most famously, Theseus ventured to Crete and in the labyrinth built under King Minos' court, he slew the ferocious Minotaur. Turns out that King Minos had for a long time ordered the neighboring city-states to send 14 of their most top g men and women to be eaten by said Minotaur every seven years. The Athenians were said to have been so enormously grateful to Theseus that his anchored ship was preserved for generations to come. Its old planks being switched out as they decayed and replaced by stronger, fresher timber. But when all the original planks of the ship on which Theseus had sailed had all decayed and been replaced, was it still the ship of Theseus? If not, at which point did it change? What if one were to preserve all the original planks as they were torn off the ship, and once all of them were gathered, rebuilt it? Would that then be the ship of Theseus? Would both or neither? An ancient paradox regarding identity and change across time, there are a plethora of different attempted solutions. Maybe you feel objects survive this gradual change, or maybe you do not. Perhaps you feel the material makeup of the ship doesn't equal the actual object. Either way you look at it, there aren't really any solid conclusions that lack for pitfalls or contradictions. It's called a paradox for a reason, I suppose. But have you ever stopped and considered just who is Micah? No biken, no biken. If you've spent any amount of time within the fighting game community, you probably run across this phrase at least once or twice. Biken, the one-armed, one-eyed samurai has been present since the very first Guilty Gear way back in 1998, a full 25 years ago, and time has not seen her popularity decrease. The last two iterations of the series, Exerd and Strive launched without her inclusion and both saw a sizable group of people very vocally clamor for her addition to each game's roster. In short, people go batshit for Biken. For a lot of people, she is one of the series' most iconic characters, but she also just happens to be one of the least played characters in the entire franchise's history. Ain't that a bit of a quandary? A quandary which just happens to be of particular interest to me, if for nothing else than the fact that I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. How can Biken simultaneously be one of the most requested and the least played characters in the series history? And who are these people who so dearly wish to see her back, yet seem to disregard her entirely mere moments after her return? But before that, perhaps a quick refresher on the woman herself. 
Biken as a character is in many ways a hodgepodge of pretty direct references to pulpy samurai serials and films that center around badass ronin on quests for revenge. Her overall character concept is almost assuredly heavily inspired by the Tange Sasen spin-off character Okin, also known as Lady Sasen. A one-armed, one-eyed, ponytailed swordswoman on a quest to find those responsible for the murder of her family and her childhood maiming. This mashed together with the pseudo-historical swordsman Shishido Baiken, popularly depicted as being a master of the Kusarigama. Contributing both her name and influencing the use of weapons hidden inside her clothing attached by chains. In game, Baiken recurrently inhabits a role that combines strong space control by way of her far reaching sword and chain attacks, vicious mix up potential with her insanely fast instant overhead Yo Sansen, and probably most notably a uniquely strong defensive focus that is most often expressed through her ability to attack out of her guard. Baiken has, at this moment in time, actually appeared in every single main iteration of the franchise. Though, as much as things have stayed the same, quite a lot has kept changing. Now, it will come as no surprise that Biken players of all ages will have a favorite iteration of the character. After all, you will tend to gravitate towards the version of the character that you were first attracted to. Maybe even to the level of disliking earlier or later ones simply because they aren't conforming to what you're used to. That's not only entirely fine, but also not what I'm at all interested in investigating. Instead, I'm interested in pondering just what the people who claim they adore the character time and time again, but who do not actually have any interest in playing her, find so alluring about her in theory and off-putting about her in practice. There certainly isn't a perfect way to dive into this, but maybe using one of the fighting game community's most well-known, long-time non-biken playing biken advocates, Maximilian, as a proxy for this fandom, is as close as we can get. Maximilian, regardless of how you feel about him, has a long-standing, and quite impressive really, career of being very attached to biken but not having that attachment translate into investing much time into piloting her. An attachment that goes way back, almost to her first appearance actually, and despite her many aesthetic and gameplay changes, seems to not have waned much over the years. I mean, the character features pretty prominently in his channel intro. Max seems to have always been a fan of Biken, almost at any given point in time. But what was Max such a fan of if many of her constituent parts have been mutable? Which of her qualities are to Max and this assortment of Biken fans her defining ones? Let's take a bit of a dive into Biken and her many iterations, starting with her aesthetics. I mean, that's generally what people first find appealing and then connect with in their characters. So, just what does Biken look and sound like? Biken's first appearance in Guilty Gear Missing Link on the PlayStation 1 saw pretty much all of her base elements get established. The samurai slash ronin story inspiration, while never being abandoned, is I think, perhaps at its most dominant in this first outing. It is often attributed to series creator Daisuke Ishwatari that Baiken was heavily inspired by manga protagonist Himura Kenshin after Daisuke had mistook him for a woman. This is, however, unsubstantiated and seems to be a popular fan theory at best. Perhaps it isn't that hard to see why that story is so easy for people to accept this fact when you see this version of the character. Missing Link Biken is easily her most androgynous design, and conjecture aside, there is definitely a likeness, one that is perhaps primarily found in her very ragged design, reminiscent of Kenshin's past as the Manslayer. Biken in her debut is 
mind the pun, all edge. Her tattered kimono, unkempt hair, and lithe figure all come together to form a very callous and dangerous look. The ragged edges of the kimono sleeve that contains the chained weapons reinforce the fact that she has been maimed in every key pose. She's a straight racer, fully focused on one thing and one thing only. The sword. Yes, when you were out partying and doing drugs, Missing Link Biken was of course studying the blade. Sadly, not that many people actually played this game back in its heyday, meaning this version of Biken has gone down without making much of a splash in the history books. Especially if you add on the fact that she was actually a hidden character. Guilty Gear X and XX Biken are for most aesthetic purposes almost identical, so they're pretty easy to tackle as a pair. These versions, I think, are what people for a very long time associated the character with. Pre-exert, I would go almost as far as saying that her first appearance in Missing Link might as well not have existed for how much these later versions dominated her public image. And for good reason too. This is where she was really solidified into a more unique character and less of a mishmash of references. The design team pumped up the volume of her hair and abandoned its reddish tint, giving it a more unique color with this pinkish hue. She gains her ever-present face tattoo, possibly based on a Buddhist Sanskrit mantra, giving her that iconic symmetry of scar and tattoo down her face. Lots of design elements return, but are yet retooled a bit, like her kimono. This version of Biken puts further visual emphasis on her missing arm by not only making the tattered sleeve physically more present in her animations and highlighting it with a pink rim, but also juxtaposing it with a much more kempt kimono. Yes, this version of Biken most people are familiar with comes off as way less physically deranged and more in line with the Toshiro Mifune-esque archetype of a badass ronin. And hell, speaking of Mifune, Baiken even has a nod to the Jojimbo chin pose. So far, I think it would be preposterous to argue that a fan of Missing Link Baiken could not very smoothly transition into considering this later version of the character to be a very reasonable evolution. Regardless if they still preferred a Baiken that was visibly more rough around the edges or not, like in Missing Link. It becomes a bit harder for me to understand this fanbase wholesale acceptance of her audiovisual design evolution once we reach Exerd, however. Not because it was poorly or haphazardly executed, but simply because of the fact that it was so very, very different. Now, I would certainly be stretching the truth if I said Biken in Exerd and Strive, yes, we are covering them both at the same time look like a completely different character. They don't. But regardless of one's personal preference in how this design compares to the earlier ones, I think it misses the mark a bit in terms of evolution. Comparatively speaking, most characters' design progression from the XX games to Exerd was handled a lot more smoothly. Using Sol and Mei as an example, one can clearly see where the designs were pushed and where restraint was shown. There's a clear respect shown to the earlier designs, and elements were kept both to reinforce a continuation of their silhouette, but also their color palette. Even in the more heavily retouched designs like Melia and Potemkin, the designers were smart enough to limit the redesigned sections to let recurring elements remain. In these designs, they retain both their overall body shapes and idle stance animations, leading them to be easily recognizable from a silhouette standpoint. I think this is arguably a lot less true for Biken pretty much across the board in every category. Not only was Biken's physique increased in volume, which to be fair was not something she was alone in gaining in the jump between XX and Exerd. But this was also accompanied by a quite large jump in terms of her clothing design. The kimono from Exert is not only different in terms of color palette and print, it's also, unlike her earlier design, layered with a coat. 
something that I think in practice puts much less emphasis on the ragged sleeve and that dichotomy with her otherwise pristine outfit. This combined with her new idol stance makes that aspect almost get lost inside the rest of her design, a stark contrast to her earlier iterations. This also came coupled with her hair not only changing hue again, but also ballooning in size. As a direct consequence of all of these changes, I think Biken is a lot less recognizable from both a silhouette and a color palette standpoint. If you further add on how her physical demeanor seems to have shifted a lot with changes made to her forward, back and run cycles amongst other things, she paints quite the different picture. All of this leads me to personally find both her strive and exert designs to be failures in terms of continuing her visual aesthetics. This doesn't mean I personally find the designs horrible or anything, it's certainly one that harbors a fair share of appeal. Finding it cool doesn't necessarily strike me as odd, especially not if this was the first bike in design one stumbled across. I do, however, have a hard time reconciling with the idea that someone who loved Biken because of her aesthetics before Exerd would be entirely psyched about the Exerd and Onward designs. It is interesting to consider how much more recognizably Biken her Exerd and Strive designs end up feeling if you just tweak a couple of parameters instead of going whole hog and fiddling with almost all aspects of her visuals. On another note, or perhaps a pair of them, it is hard to talk about Biken's physical changes between the XX and later games without talking about both the size and emphasis put on her breasts. Video game politicking aside, I'm firmly of the belief that Biken has always been a sexually charged character, and that her sex appeal has been a strong attracting force for a lot of players. To say anything else is arguably pretty off base, I think. Heck, Maximilian himself has even commented on this literal fact several times over the years. The hottest one-armed chick ever in a fighting game. What interests me though is that I wouldn't really agree that XX Biken and Exert Biken are sexy in the same ways. The sex appeal of the X and XX versions of Biken, I would argue, both hinge on the dangerous and taboo nature of her confidence. Both Biken's mannerisms and her physical appearance are divorced from traditional femininity, yet the character is presented as being a really confident and self-secure actor. This, in spite of her active non-conforming to traditionally appealing mannerisms and her disfigured physique. One also has to remember that Guilty Gear's aesthetics are firmly rooted in anime, meaning while her physique would make her a swimsuit model in our world, it is presented as being somewhat run-of-the-mill by the comparison to her contemporaries from the series. Something that makes Biken's confidence in the face of her physical marring even more of a statement. XX Biken derives a lot of her sexiness from an almost callous flouting of convention. Exert and Strive Biken, on the other hand, I think arguably both derive their sex appeal from an adherence to convention, rather than a flouting of it. While I still think Biken reads as a badass in these games, her physique has not only literally been enhanced to a much higher degree than her contemporaries, it's also coupled with, in my opinion, visuals that minimize her disfiguring and put her desirable physical qualities even more in the center of the spotlight. As a direct consequence of this, Biken's more direct flaunting of her goods comes across as less taboo. I mean, of course she would be confident in this situation. In universe, she would be extremely desirable. Now, it is of course conceivable that you could enjoy both these designs in different ways. But if you find both of them sexually appealing in the same way, I wonder what that way would constitute. An Asian broad with a sword? Is that it? Again, the point I'm trying to make here is not that people cannot have a preference. It is more so that if Biken's visuals were what really attracted you to the character and you were just begging for her to reappear, wouldn't something like this be what you had in mind? It seems to me that the general blasé or outright, okay, good, she's back, responses that Biken's redesigns were met with 
would indicate that it wasn't necessarily the main factor in what made her appealing to Maximilian and company. And the same story can be applied to her voice, which similarly seems to be an aspect of Biken both Max and other longtime fans point to as being one of her great character qualities. Biken has had a lot of voice actors over the years. And not only that, but several pretty distinct directions for those actors to take the character. Is this the voice people recognize and love? Or is it this one? Or this? Or what about this? But hey, there's a lot more to a character than their aesthetics. I mean, you can be a massive fan of how they play and be super glad when they come back and not care as much about their visuals, right? So, what does Biken's gameplay look like? That's not as easy of a question to answer as one might think. Unless you thought it would be a bit complicated, in which case you are correct. I'm going to present an idea here that some people might not fully agree with. Fighting game characters, in general, tend to not change that much between iterations. That's not necessarily that odd either. Characters and their functionality tend to account for the majority of what the games have to offer in terms of their interactivity. The other large part, of course, being the system-wide mechanics. But you can't really market new games to the general public on system mechanics, which makes it a lot easier to just keep familiar faces around and have the system mechanics be the big new thing that will influence the larger changes in the core gameplay loop. This is, of course, a generalization. But to me, characters changing big time between iterations, like Jin from Tekken 3 to 4, stand out so much largely because it is so rare. And probably rightfully so. Characters have fans, and if you majorly change how they work, you run the risk of upsetting their player bases. With all that said, has Biken's gameplay changed a ton between game versions? Yes, and no. Biken's offense-orientated bag of tricks was something she appeared with more or less fully formed in the first game of the series, though some of them certainly functioned in a different way than they would come to do. Different as they may be, all the bangers are still here. Tatami Gaish, Biken's projectile, works in a pretty similar way to what one might be used to. Its grounded version doesn't launch, unlike in later games, but the air version not only has extremely low recovery, but there is no limit to how many you can have on screen at the same time, meaning you can make a literal wall of tatami mats. Her other special moves all seem to follow this mold of strong idea coupled with somewhat odd execution. Yosanzen is, unlike in other titles, not an overhead something that might make it seem pretty useless in practice, but unlike later games, it recovers extremely quick and actually gains bike and height on use. Meaning it is not only advantageous on guard, but she can also technically just disappear from a match whenever she feels like it. Bye bye Baiken. Rounding out her specials is Kamai Tachi, a long range move where Baiken extends a chain into the opponent. This one not only reaches insanely far, but is actually an overhead for some reason. An overhead that's actually punishable on hit if faced up against a savvy opponent. Don't feel too bad for this first outing of the character though. She still had access to a bunch of strong disjointed normals that any Biken player will be intimately familiar with, and on top of that, easily accessible infinite combos in a game without burst. I mean, most of the cast have that, but Biken does too. Now, again, like zero people have actually spent any actual time with Missing Link. 
and even fewer of those zero unlocked by Ken for play which means people probably don't really consider this version much, if at all, when it comes to what springs to mind when they think of Biken. I only really brought her up to show you that as much as things change, things stay the same. As with the aesthetics of Biken, X and XX are probably what form the basis of what the majority of people considered her core toolkit and playstyle. Lots of these things will be familiar. Tatami Gaish is back, though you can no longer carpet bomb your opponent with multiples of it in the air. It does now launch though, which is muy bien. Yozansen quickly becomes a super useful overhead with insane speed. Though you sadly can't launch yourself to Mars with it anymore. And Kamaitachi becomes Kabari, a slow mid strike with a potential follow up second hit. As a cherry on top, Baiken gains Suzuran, a command dash that lets her move forward and still auto guard highs and mids. Now I wonder why you give a character a move with auto guard. But more on that later. These specials combined with some extremely strong key normals like the amazing jumping slash with its great range and disjointed hitbox allow Baiken to act, well, really quite belligerently in the air. 2D, a special and jump cancelable low that allows her to open people up in a really fucked up way if they start getting scared of her overhead mix-ups with Yosansen, and far slash for a poking and space controlling normal that basically has it all. Great speed, good gatlings, and a disjointed hitbox. These core moves and the offensive slash footsies related playstyle Baiken is afforded by them is largely something that has never changed. There are definitely additions, slight or, you know, large, but in a general sense, this part of the character's identity is one that has remained, at least on a surface level, extremely similar over every following iteration of Guilty Gear. The particular strength of her offensive capabilities sort of wax and wanes depending on the title. In Exert, for example, it is more pronounced, but comes with a heightened risk-reward aspect while in XX, she tends to play a little bit more reserved. But relegating Baiken to only this toolkit not only misses half of her available moves, it is also exceedingly uninspired. Having a projectile that allows you to run set play on the opponent's wake up relatively safely, a strong footsies game, and a vicious high-low mix-up are sort of dime a dozen as far as Guilty Gear goes. And the longer the series went on, those same key ingredients became so recurring that they amounted for like half the roster at any given point in time. Love it or hate it, Guilty Gear characters tend to not have their characterization be expressed through the inclusion of mix-ups and slow projectiles. Milia has disc, yes, but she is also super duper nimble and has an insane approach tool with pin. Raven has orb and air dash mix, but he also has great zoning options, debuffs, and managing his recoverable health. And Biken, well, her special ability lies in the fact that if you fuck around, she will let you find out. Yes, Viken's unique selling point, or gimmick, or thing, in X and XX was, and is, the ability to do offensive actions from Blockstun. This specific quality of Viken is why a lot of long-time Guilty Gear players either love or hate playing against the character. Guilty Gear, as a series, is one that overtly at least focuses on aggressive offense-related options. Especially at intermediate levels of play, this often pushes people to have pretty polarized opinions toward Baiken in these early titles. 
The games in general all have systems that visibly reward the aggressor and punish the one on guard. Something coupled with an ease of access to strong set play. Something that leads to offensive block strings, mix-ups and okizeme all at times falling into a potentially rehearsed I get to do things now area. Because of Baiken's extremely unique ability to execute half her moveset from block, with potentially devastating results, the mental stack and series of interactions to consider do not necessarily lessen at all once the person ostensibly wins neutral and starts running their pressure. X and XX guard cancels cannot necessarily be described as a monolith, but as a general idea, they tended to offer her either options with limited or full invulnerability, allowing her to either blow through follow-up attacks or make her way out of sketchy situations. Though I will take a little bit of time to talk specifically about Bach, a meter-dependent, uh, super or force break move, that allows Baiken to throw out a massive, um, either advantageous or at least quite safe hitbox from guard and can then choose to apply certain debuffs to the opponent on hit, be that limiting their ability to dash, jump or backdash, be put in a counter hit state for all following attacks, or disabling their ability to guard Baiken's next attack. Baku is a further reinforcement of her playstyle being tied to limiting the opponent's options by turning them against themselves. Baku quite literally meaning to seal or bind. Pretty much all of the guard cancels are executed by doing a reverse quarter circle from back to down. A pretty wonky input as far as traditional fighting game motions come and one that definitely leaves room for error and points of exploitation by the opponent. The motion being so odd is probably also a compounding reason as to why Baiken never had a high pick rate in these games. Not being able to grasp how to execute half your move list is probably not very conducive to approachability. Funnily enough, Max himself noted that while Guilty Gear X was possibly the game he had spent the absolute most time with over the series lifespan, he had never executed one of Baiken's supers done out of Blockstun, a super that represents a whopping one-eighth of her entire move list in that game. She's got a super... Uh, she's got a super that she can do from block, but I can never fucking... I've like barely ever done it. I don't even know how good it is. We're gonna find out. There's a super I have that I would love to do. Back, half circle, back. Okay, let's try it. Not it. Definitely not it. Add on to the fact that Viken is traditionally a very low health character in a game series known for high damage. And, well, you can see where I'm going with this. Due to the nature of the guard cancels, they lended themselves very heavily to certain types of extremely useful applications. For one, they are extremely strong in the neutral game, as they allow Baiken to dash up towards her opponent and in reaction to their mid-range pokes, which in Guilty Gear often ends up being two hits because of the Gatling system, guard cancel between hits to seize the momentum. Even more useful are negative edge guard cancels. Because the guard cancels themselves aren't executable from a neutral state, if one inputs it outside of block stun, Baiken will just execute the normal button tied to the specific guard cancel. Which of course isn't great since you can get baited pretty heavily and if you recall, Baiken is about as durable as cardboard. Which ain't great. However, since you can negative edge specials in Guilty Gear, uh, that is executing the move with the button release and not the press, you can do some funky stuff. Like buffered negative edge guard cancels on wake up that will absolutely destroy meaty attacks from the opponent and she will do absolutely nothing if they didn't press. That's pretty neat. In some of the games, this combination of strong offense, good damage and the uniqueness of guard cancels allow Baiken to be counted amongst the strongest characters in the cast. In others, like the aforementioned X, which is fucking bonkersville, 
having super easy looping unblockables and readily available infinite combos in a game that doesn't have burst yet by the way, these things instead let her compete with the rest. Simply because she gets to counterplay stuff that the rest of the cast more or less just die to. Regardless of how you feel about her, in X and XX you really needed to sit down and engage with how Biken worked to not just get rolled by her at any decent levels of play. At the tail end of the XX series, the dev team started toying with the idea of allowing Biken to utilize these guard cancel moves in a more direct way, like letting her execute them directly from Suzuran without blocking any move, allowing her to, for example, do stuff like this as a combo ender. In Exerd, this guard cancel is still very much present, but it changes in execution. Big time. The same core concepts still apply. Biken is allowed to do special moves out of block stun, but they have been revamped heavily. Instead of just having a selection of executable specials with different inputs, Biken is granted a move called Azami. Azami acts more like a parry stance with follow-ups than just a special move, where hitting into it allows Biken to execute one of five follow-up moves. Azami can also be executed from guard, just like the XX versions. Chiefly, she now has to decide between doing a low catching or a high catching parry out of guard before she can actually execute any attack meaning that the opponent has more offensive options in play capable of beating out an attempt to attack out of guard. Not to mention the fact that she can no longer do powerful techniques like negative edge OS and is instead left in a counter hit recovery state if no attack showed up, which because of Viking's paper mache body means bad things will quickly be coming her way. Destroy. One of the biggest additions of note is that Exert Biken can execute Azami in the air, allowing her to utilize it as a super strong anti-anti-air tool. With Tsubaki, one of the air moves out of Azami being a super fast and incredibly active attack with great damage potential. Notably, she also retained the ability to do moves out of Suzuran, and now the Azami follow-ups instead of guard cancel moves executed by the press of a button instead of doing the sort of wonky guard cancel input. Exert is a version of Biken that people in general seemed less mad about when facing, probably at least in part because of it being easier to grasp how to work around Azami versus her XX style guard cancels. While Biken changed a lot gameplay wise between XX and Exert, the core of this balance between strong offense, mid-range game and defense remained intact. Even though Exert Biken in the end arguably pans out to be a very recognizable experience to how she functioned in XX, it was always interesting to see how, just like with her big visual jump between games, the Biken fanbase were pretty uncontroversially accepting of these new changes, even from the get-go. Some of it is I think pretty understandable. Lots of characters had the floor for executing their game plan made drastically easier compared to their earlier games. So if you really liked how she played in XX but found it a bit too daunting, I understand loving these changes whole hog. Still, even having been made easier to pilot for beginners to intermediate players, she remained a seldom seen character throughout Exert's lifespan. And this pattern of embracing any and all change as a big positive was set to replay once she came back in Strive. It's kind of hard to dance around this next part, so I'll just get to it. In the jump from Exert to Strive, the dev team more or less just deleted this unique selling point of Biken's. No XX style guard cancel moves and no Azami parry stands out of guard. Uh, or just in neutral either. Replacing this entire suite of defense orientated special attacks is Hiragi. A pretty bog standard parry type move with extremely fast startup, in which Biken catches an opponent and slams them to the ground for big damage. Or just repels them if they are out of range. 
Hiragi, while being a very strong version of a parry, is still just a parry though. Sure, Azami from Exerd also had the parry-like drawbacks of a whiff animation, but Hiragi is just a straight up parry. Meaning, unlike in earlier titles, it cannot catch projectiles, cannot be held to extend the activation period, and crucially, is impossible to do out of guard. You could argue that Strive as a game in general was designed to be a more stripped down system for its characters. But it is hard to not notice how Viking got hit especially hard in terms of change of game plan and just raw loss of special moves. Whereas most other characters lost one or two often pretty tertiary moves in the jump from Exerd to Strive, or almost none like Sol or Kai, Baiken not only lost access to this suite of defensive specials, but because the guard cancel aspect of her character was made completely null and void, tactics and special moves connected to said ability also had to go, meaning Zuzuran, her advancing auto guard move, was also dropped entirely. You might think that this renewed focus on specifically her offensive game came with a bunch of new flashy tools. And if you thought that, you'd be wrong. In fact, Baiken's aggressive arsenal was more or less left entirely unchanged with one caveat. The slash version of Kabari and her throws now attaches her and the opponent together by a tether. Which, to be fair, is pretty gosh darn wild and is something that does add a significant amount of tactical depth to her kit. But I think you could easily argue that it is at the very least a sort of plus minus zero situation overall. Now, considering what we now know of how Baiken has functioned and evolved over the years, how do you think her drastic redesign in Strive was met by this fanbase? An intense bout of disbelief and outcry? A period of disappointment followed by acceptance? No. None of the above. The decision by Arxis to forsake her former unique selling point was met almost wholly without controversy and generally with open arms. Baiken was back, and that is always what is most important, right? It seems to me that the no Baiken crowd is regardless of what sorts of changes are brought on by her return be they aesthetic or gameplay based, always just as satisfied with her return. Which again, if we loop back to the original question, who is Baiken to these players, sadly leaves us no closer to any answer. Max was obviously self-identifying as a fan of Baiken at all these points in time. It's super easy to find him on record saying that exact thing. But if her visual design and her voice direction or even actor wasn't super important, nor her sort of main shtick gameplay wise, then what remains? Any one armed lady with a katana? Would this character I just made up scratch that itch enough? I'm not trying to say it is wrong to enjoy things. Enjoying things is in fact rad and cool. In these lands, we love an enjoyer. But looking at my own experiences in fighting games and life, if something I really enjoy changes a ton, it causes me to hesitate a bit. I really, really like Slayer in Guilty Gear. He's one of my all-time favorite fighting game characters. Slayer is not in Strive though. But there is a character in there who shares some of his traits, a character called Nagoriyuki. He's a vampire, just like Slayer. He shares a couple of special moves and some of his aesthetics. If Nagoriyuki had just visually been Slayer with a sword, I don't think I would have been very thrilled about it at first. Not because his toolkit is objectively worse or anything, but it certainly would have felt like a huge departure. Perhaps I would have warmed up to that change given some time, or maybe I wouldn't. But that's the part I really don't get. 
Max and the rest of the fans seem very attached to an idea, but maybe not so much any practical reality. But maybe I've been going at it from the wrong direction all this time. Yes, Biken has changed a lot over the years. But what people like Max enjoyed about her might not be this sort of ephemeral quality I'm looking for at all. And instead, it could be based entirely in what remained the same. Namely, Biken's strong neutral control and aggressive 50-50s. Max has somewhat recently talked expressly on how he feels about Biken in Stride, where he generally rates the changes as very positive ones. Something that fits pretty well with the fact that Max seems to have been consistently quite uninterested in Biken's defensive suite of options. From the aforementioned not having ever used her guard cancel super in X, to being sad to see Susuran go, seemingly entirely because of losing access to the offensive utility being able to do the moves out of it gave him. This coupled with absolutely no mention of those moves primarily being tied to Azami and guard cancels whatsoever. Max ends up saying that he feels like these changes are positive ones because Biken is such a popular character that she ought to be an accessible one. And maybe he's right. If you compare Strive numbers to earlier titles, Biken does have more players now than she did in the past. And quite significantly so. Going from one of the least to one of the most played in the entire roster. But should Biken, like Max says, be for everyone because she's so popular? Or should she be for people who enjoyed what she brought to the table in the first place? The XX and even Exert games were all a pretty long time ago at this point. Can't really keep designing games for the same people decade after decade. And those games also still exist, right? Who is in the right here? And can you extend the character herself, this very idea of Biken, the rights to remain as she was? That might seem an entirely ridiculous idea. Biken is not, after all, a real person. At least I don't think she is. But changes, whether we see them as good or bad, signal different things to the world. A large group of people feel it is a moral failing to pick a character color that happens to lighten the skin tone of the character in question. Are they right in thinking that? I don't know. But to them it signals something unethical, even though no real person is actively impacted by it at the moment of occurrence. Biken has in all dimensions of art, lore, gameplay, regardless if you were inhabiting her role or going up against her, gone from a character that was literally hard to approach to one that is now readily available and less complex. From a fortress siege to a bar brawl, from all edge to curvaceous mom figure, and from very unique to quite typical. In 1757, British philosopher Edmund Burke published a treatise on aesthetics regarding the beautiful and the sublime. We're kind of running long here, so I'll paraphrase a bit if you don't mind. To Burke, beauty was something unproblematic and pleasant. A summer's day or a flower arrangement. Another form of aesthetic allure, however, he described as belonging to something he called the sublime. A distant mountain range or a starry night sky. Images that, unlike the beautiful, stir up feelings not altogether positive. Experiencing something sublime is to feel threatened in some way, but to also feel your ability to overcome that intimidation. It is daunting and terrible and magnetic at the same time. When Max talks about the changes Biken has received over the years, and if they were in the end worthwhile, he has this to say. I think they have a pretty good balance at turning Biken into the character that people thought she was. 
that then, regardless of the nice and pleasant feelings brought on by finally getting to play her, reads to me as a capitulation of sorts. The sublime has been tossed aside instead of overcome, and in the end, we all know that beauty is just skin deep. Oh, and if you were wondering, Max is still not playing Viking.